Father, we thank you in the name of Yeshua, our Savior, our Lord, our Messiah, for everything you've done to us and to the house of Israel. You are faithful. Thank you that we're connected to you. We're connected to the people here in the land, and we're connected to all all the people who are yours in all the world. Thank you that you so much love us. You love Israel and you love the world that you created. So we praise you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Maran Yeshua. Amen. In Psalm 71, I chose to read it today because I'm 71 years old. I have a a few more months to read this psalm. But when, 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 uh, later. when um, David wrote this psalm, David HaMelech, David, King David, he's known in the West that way, he was already up in the age, but he wasn't exactly at the end of his life yet, but he was already older. There are many special things in this psalm that really bless us. In the first verse, he says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Many things were happening at that time, and his son was rebelling against him. It's around the same time era when he wrote this psalm, as far as we know. But he said, let me never be put to confusion. I I don't go into the Hebrew words now. But our God is wonderful. We put our trust in him. Many times the problem is that we can put our trust in other things. Uh, In our experience, in people, in bank accounts, and what we think. But David was learning, the the wonderful king of Israel was learning to put only in God his trust, only in Elohim, only in Adonai, our Lord. And he needed deliverance in his struggles. If it is like people, many people feel that it was in a time of when his uh, son came against him, Avshalom, deliver me in thy righteousness. He needed that kind of deliverance and caused me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me and save me. There are many times that we need to escape troubles. Uh, Yeshua, our Lord, taught us to Pray, lead us not into temptation. There are things we need to escape. Uh, The Bible also says, flee from uh, youthful lusts. Leave, uh, escape from temptations and various things. And the longer we live, the more we learn what what an amazing God we have, that we can always trust in him. In verse 3, he says, Be thou my strong habitation, like a strong rock, a place where we can go. Such a strong shelter and habitation, where do I may continually resort, that we always go back to him, always go back to him. And we never need to be afraid that he's going to condemn us. We're told to bring all our sins and our worries and our troubles to him. But he will always deliver us. When we look at the life of King David, for example, he wasn't perfect in himself. The reason why he trusted was not because he was always so good, but because we have such a good God, Mm. Elohim, Adonai. He is God. Thou hast given a commandment to save me. Well, we think often like 
the mitzvot, the commandments are ten commandments and all this. But God says, uh, it's, God has given a commandment to save his own. He's given us, he, he's given a commandment, like a king orders a word, this person must be saved from his trouble. Well, he, have many, he has many angels, and he will save us. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Rock, let the earth shake, but God will not shake. Like God says in the book of uh, Malachi, uh, he says what happens in the end times, and God will also, in Habakkuk, as it says, God will shake. God will shake all things that can be shaken. But he is that rock that cannot be shaken. And he is our fortress. I don't know what needs you have today. I know Israel has huge needs. Israel has tremendous needs. And it always um, concerns me that we would not stop to pray for the situation. We would not stop to pray for the situation. It's, it's very, very important. Normally, uh, these days, while we have this war situation, when I wake up in the morning, I quickly... Well, I first of all, I praise God and bow down to Him. And even before I read, I'll check in the news. Did anyone die last night in the battles? Or was it, how was the battle? Because the battle in Israel is, it affects all of us. It affects the whole nation. And it affects actually the whole world. After this battle, the world Actually, during this battle, the world has radically changed, very radically changed. But before I go on, I want to just impress one thing that came into my heart. We as God's creatures, human beings, we don't always see the way God sees we have our own viewpoint, which we could call human viewpoint. God has his viewpoint, divine viewpoint. We have our viewpoint. It's our viewpoint that gives us the trouble. It is our viewpoint that allows us to see more what the enemy is doing and not what God is doing. We have to remember everything he has already done for us what he did for us, the atonement, resurrection, the new life, resurrection life in us. We have no condemnation. These are amazing things that we could go on and on. But also what God is doing today. I use this often in my own mind and meditation as an example. What was in the news when Goliath in the West, it's called Goliath in English-speaking countries. When Goliath came with his big uh, javelin and, and his battle gear, and he came on the top of the hill and challenged all of Israel, I can guarantee that that was the news of the day. Mm. That was the talk of the day. So everyone focused on the enemy. Everyone focused on what the enemy is doing. That's all we know to do. But if they had been very wise, and maybe some people were, they would have gone to talk to the prophet. There was a prophet in the land whom God called to speak his word. His name was Shmuel, Samuel Shmuel. And if they had gone to the prophet or one of his friends or close allies, they would have said, did anything happen lately? And the prophet would say, yeah, something happened. But we're not supposed to talk about it right now. But I'll tell you, the real king 
who will do the will of God, who will save Israel, the real king, who is according to his heart, was chosen and anointed. The big event of the day was that David was anointed. So when Goliath comes, this is a reaction from the kingdom of the enemy, and I mean now primarily the spiritual kingdom. That was the enemy's reaction to what happened. People didn't know, and it was, it's good that they didn't know that the, that the real king was anointed because Shaul wanted to really, he didn't want him to be the king. So the enemy reacted by sending this giant. So there was... Benjamin? Is that you? So the good news is that God did something. He anointed his king. But what we see on the ground is huge battle and nobody is able to go and challenge this until King David came. And it even looked like David doesn't have any chances. Yeah, but David had the anointing of God. He had the blessing of God. It was the word of the Lord from heaven anoint this man. And when he was anointed, it was already a done deal. We do not see this way. And I take it to the situation today. Today the world has made amazing moves. I'm not going to the detail uh, today about what these moves are. But the world is making their own moves. We need to take a lot of land uh, from Israel. And in practice it would be a Islamic state. If they make a state it would be an Islamic state. Islamic State in practice. Of course, it's not called that, but that's what it would be. I'm not saying it's going to happen, and I'm not saying it's not, not going to happen. God has his own way through all that fog to bring victory. Yes, but the world has united, you know, climate change and will tell how economies will work and these things will work. And amazing things are happening, uh, according to Psalm 2, that the world is united. But you know why that is so? Because God has said, it is time to send deliverance to Yaakov, to Jacob. It's time to save Israel. What did our Lord Messiah Yeshua do? He purchased the world and he redeemed us. But he also purchased the world to himself, the whole earth. He purchased the world. So he's going to come and take what he purchased. He's taking back his own creation. He's the creative word of the Father. Father created through him everything. In him all things were created. And then the creation that rebelled against him, he purchased it. Then is the Big news. When we see the whole earth will be gathering, like in Zechariah chapter 12, against Jerusalem, the whole earth will come and they decide what will happen in Jerusalem. Yes, they want to take control of Jerusalem. But God says, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I, Zion, Mount Zion. I have said my king. So the enemy will be trapped, spiritual enemy, but also it involves human enemies that because they don't want to belong to God. So enemy will be trapped in Israel. So we are kind of like wondering, what about now? We're under tremendous pressure. We're under tremendous stress here in Israel. We are. But this is the trap where the enemy will be trapped. And when the enemy is trapped here, he has nowhere to go. And, and this age 
will come to a closure. The mystery age where God has operated a certain way in, a, in like a secretive way, like in a tabernacle, will turn into an open victory. The secret word, work that he's done in millions of hearts over the last 2,000 years, millions of people have belonged to him and they've been persecuted, they've been in trouble and they've been trying to go according to the word of God. Many Jewish people, by the way, have been in these moves of God. Many, 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 many people. In the beginning of the mystery age 2,000 years ago, there was much move of God in North Africa. Much of the, many of the Israelites went precisely to North Africa. We have documents about this, but this is not my topic. So what I'm saying now is that when it looks like it's really dark, uh, you know, the day star shines when it's the darkest moment, early in the morning. So when it looks the darkest, darkest, I have a window where I many times when it's very dark and I get up early in the morning, I'm looking for the day star. If the sky is clear, I see the day star. It's so bright at the darkest moment. So we have a choice to make. I can look for the day star and focus on the day star. I see the dark. I see it's no problem. But I'm going to focus on the day star. I, I'm not going to focus on the dark. The dark is a sign that it's time for the day star. And day star announces the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah said to one of the seven churches, or Kehilot, as we say in Hebrew, so one of the seven assemblies, the Messiah said, I will give you the morning star. The morning star, because you're waiting, I give you the morning star. That's the promise of his coming. You see, I'm coming for you. You have nothing to worry. I took your sins. I took your troubles. I carried your faults. And even your physical weaknesses, I've carried everything and I continue to carry. Even healing, if it doesn't work the same moment, we're going to believe that God is our healer. We're going to believe. We're just going to be like little children. So this is not an easy moment for the world, but this is a great moment. This is a great moment. Two years ago, uh, about two years ago, it's actually a rough estimation. I watched Israeli television, and Netanyahu, our prime minister, said, the time of Jacob's trouble is coming now. There have been many, many thoughts, what is Jacob's trouble? Tsarat Yaakov, Tsarat Yaakov. What is Jacob's trouble? Well, when we remember Jacob in the Bible, in uh, chapters 31 and 32 of Genesis, he's coming back from uh, Padan Aram. Uh, in Greek, it's called Mesopotamia, but I like the Aramaic uh, Hebrew name, Padan Aram, or we, either way. When he was coming back, he was going to face his brother Esau, Esau. So his trouble was coming back to the land. His trouble was coming back to the land. We have a similar situation today. Much of this trouble is for the Jews outside the land. We're seeing every day reports in New York. Uh, many Jews are attacked. There's attacks against them and and, and London, and uh, they smashed a, a car of a Jewish shop owner and broke it, and good that they didn't kill him. And all these things are like daily things, and universities have a problem because they have not been able to even uh, provide security for the Jewish students. So we have that on one side. At the same time, we, we are very, very glad that God is also 
working in the whole wide world. I was watching a wonderful conference in Helsinki, Dr. Shala was there, and they are, they are making constantly plans to bring the good news of the Messiah to new countries, new places. Very good, very good. Take the good news everywhere, and we rejoice as we go. God is working in all different fronts. I want to say one little thing here. Many, many years I was uh, thinking about it, kind of like um, sad about it, that the good news of the Messiah is often proclaimed not in a way that a regular Jewish person here would recognize that it is our message, because it's different, used, uh, there's a different vocabulary and different way and different expressions and... Uh, the confessions of faith don't mention that uh, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It says he created the world, he redeemed everyone, and now come and believe and turn from your sins. This all is good and right, but it doesn't have like the way, exactly the way the apostles wrote it, that he's Messiah as the seed of Abraham and seed of David. He's like in another garment. But God helped me when I was a little bit thinking about that. And, and I, I believe the Lord raised this question in my heart. Was it Joseph's own choice that he left his garment that his father gave him? Or was it taken from him? It wasn't his choice. When Joseph was given the food, the good wheat, to all the world that came, I mean all the nations, whoever came to Egypt, he was feeding the world in a different kind of a garment, a very nice white Egyptian garment. He had an Egyptian look and maybe a headgear and whatever. He looked like an Egyptian man. It wasn't his choice, but it was the father's plan that it happens this way in a hidden way. And I say, this is amazing. I'm not going to be sad that it happened that way, in a way that is kind of like strange to our culture here. I'm not going to be sad about it, but I'm going to rejoice when, you remember when Moses was there in the land of Midian? And uh, he delivered the seven daughters from those bad shepherds, they went to their father and they said, an Egyptian man helped us. Okay, Egyptian man helped us. So this so-called Egyptian man that wasn't really Egyptian, okay, he joined the family and then finally God appeared to him. After 40 years and God appeared to him in a burning bush, and then he went back to his calling to bring the people home. And that time, it was known to everybody who he was. That time, his whole family knew exactly what it was about. Now is God's timing. Now is God's timing to restore these things. Even to restore the understanding that everyone can understand it. That everyone can understand it. Okay, this is the setting, but above, we want to understand the setting, but above all, we want to understand his heart, his heart. There's one lady that was in India, he was actually, he was actually uh, in one of these monasteries, or nunasteries, how do you say, nuns? Convents is the right word. And she was helping these poor, poorest of the poorest in India. But she made one statement that really, I had to start thinking about it, how good it was. They were asking her kind of like, what are you, what, is, what are you saying to the world and what is your message to the world? that lives so selfishly. 
she said, it doesn't matter so much what we speak, but what matters is how much does God speak through us. That's it. How much does God speak through us? And that's why these kind of people, they prayed always. They prayed like King David here. That, Deliver me, O oh my God, out of the hand of the wicked, verse 4, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. And then, for thou art my hope, O oh Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. And then he takes a look. David, when he comes towards the latter part of his life, his son goes against him and he has all these amazing, amazing troubles. He remembers when he was a little boy, like three, four kilograms in weight. Verse 6, By thee, or by you, have I been holding up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. What was going in his mind? I believe that he just realized it's from God that I'm in this world. It wasn't my idea. He made me. He has a plan. He is my Redeemer. He's my Creator. I'm here for, for Him and from Him. I owe everything to Him, even my next step. When we think about Israel today, Israel belongs to God. The world wants to give Israel its own ideas and agendas. Israel belongs to God. And God used Israel to bring the Messiah into the world. And with the Messiah, the whole Bible, the first part of the Bible and the New Covenant part of the Bible, the whole Bible came through Israel. So Israel's destiny is in the hand of God. How about the assembly, the church, the Ed'ada, as it is in Aramaic, or many people call the, use the word ecclesia. It's interesting. Ecclesia is called out of something, called out. But Ed'ada has the other meaning. It's like the gathering, the gathering unto the Lord, the gathering to him, taken out to go in. So, if I can see everything I am, everything I have is from God, like Paul or Shaul, the, the messenger of God said, what do you have that you have not received? I have nothing that I, have, I haven't received. Well, I may have read books. I listened to excellent teachers, unbelievably great teachers, especially in America and also in uh, Scandinavia. And I befriended Richard Warbrand also, who represented the Suffering Church. But anything I've learned from people or from the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, none, none of it is from me. All of we have is from God. So thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you. You took me when I was that size from my mother's womb. And now I'm here. I'm an older person. You've done the whole thing. How about Israel? Israel wasn't man's idea. Israel was God's idea. And the seven churches, or Ed Atta, the Ecclesia, wasn't man's idea. All this is God's idea. And it will all end up in one 
New Jerusalem. Just like in coin, you have two sides. We can talk about ecclesia on one side of the coin. Israel of God is the other side of the coin. It'll all end up with the same faith that the Hebrew apostles had. We have a redeeming God with him, with the Messiah. We've been crucified to the world. We're risen again. We are a new creation. We're a new creation. Jerusalem will be unbelievable for a thousand years. We're right in the center of it right now, but this whole thing will be unbelievable, almost unrecognizable, how glorious it is. So it's still a few more moments, struggle and distress while we wait for the white garments. It's still a little bit distress and struggle and tears and praying and all this. But we're already looking into the other side. There's resistance because victory is on the way and in God's sight it is as good as done. When the anointing oil went on the head of King David, it was as good as done. But then we had to see it. That's why God said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. But David, who had this kind of a life, who remembered, I owe everything to God. God is my deliverer. God has called me at this crucial hour to be the king in Israel. The whole direction of the nation turned. That was the corner point there. Uh, we turned from the 12th tribe Israel that it was, that it had no kings. Okay, the first king came, but he backslid. So King David was at that corner point when the first righteous king came up for the 12 tribes of Israel. So David knew, David knew that this is not a normal time. Thank God he stood. Even when he failed, the failure is not the biggest thing. And we, I'm not saying we should fail, no. But, but what we do with our failures. And as soon as the prophet said to him, you are the man, thou art the man, he said, it's actually he said, I have sinned. Many people in the Bible have said, I have sinned. Some of them meant it. Some of them didn't mean it. David was one of those that meant it. As soon as he said that, God said, so is your sin put away. He just had to go through certain difficulties that the nation would see that the kings are not preferred other people. And then he says in verse 7, and maybe I'll, uh, I'll close there. He says, I am as a wonder unto many, but thou art my strong refuge. Now, I want to say a couple of words about this sentence. I am as a wonder to many. Have you thought about this verse? I remember when uh, in Scandinavia, Many people began to come to Israel to pray. They, they, they came to pray and they came every year during the feast. They told me that their neighbors, their neighbors said to them, why are you going again there to pray? Save your money and go to Mallorca or somewhere else or where it's more peaceful. Why you always go there? Also, when we made a decision to listen to the voice of the Savior, and we were what's called, you know, became believers, like an inner new birth experience, that's one way how many people realize we are a wonder to many. But then if we really depend on God, like King David, he took me out of the womb, Everything I have is a gift. I have nothing to boast of. I'm trusting in him. I don't care if the whole world comes against me. I am trusting in him. 
People that walk by faith like this and live by grace, everything is grace. God doesn't owe me anything. I haven't produced anything from my own powers. Everything that I've even done, I've done by the giftings he gave me. Even if I get a harvest, I'm using the seed that God created. Like King Solomon said well in 1 Kings chapter 8, out of your own we have given given you. We give him back to you out of your own what you've given to us. That's right. So if we live that way, if we live by grace, if we live in a way that we don't condemn ourselves, we just give our sins to Yeshua, and then we get cleansed, and then we walk in a clean road, and we keep doing it. And we live by grace. We don't think like the rest of the world think. We don't think that now Israel is going to be destroyed or, by the way, all believers are under unbelievable pressure who believe the word of God. The pressure, the same pressure is in all the believers, the true believers. Same pressure. You can't even speak what is the morality that God put in the Bible. You can't even speak the right way anymore. So it's not just Israel alone in this struggle. This is a struggle of the whole earth, like Israeli leaders said just in the last few days on, on television. So we that live by the word, we that live by grace, we that live by trusting him, weak as we are, and leaning on him as we are, and we need his comfort. But if we live that way, we begin to be, we find ourselves in verse 7. I'm as a wonder unto many, but who, but thou art my strong refuge. The long, the more we begin to understand the word of God, Davar Adonai, the more we understand the word of God and go by that word, People that go by natural mind, they don't understand. They say, like, who are you? What are you doing? Why are you thinking this way? And the world is saying now, why do you stand with Israel? Israel is killing people everywhere, and they don't realize this is a war that we didn't put on ourselves. We had no choice. Mm. But it, it affects every area. I see the politicians in America, on, uh, in the American Congress, who are trying to speak for the family life, the way that was said in the Ten Commandments, that are trying to defend even human life the way God made it. They are under the same battle. So, so what do we do? We say that I am, I am as a wonder to many. That's fine. But I have no other options. I have only one option. Yeshua, the Messiah. God of Israel, the Father, who gave the Messiah. To follow him, to follow his Messiah, to follow his spirit. The word of God, the word of God. I follow the word of God. And that leaves us in this battle to be praying for Israel and to be praying that the right message of the true salvation would go to the ends of the earth. We pray for everyone, everyone who are with God. And we pray for those that are not yet to come in. <coughs> So I do need to bring it to a close, but I have to touch verse 14 in the same psalm. Then when we are in a place where we're not feeling so much and experiencing so much, the psalmist says, I will hope continually and I will yet praise thee more and more. But the translation here is a little bit not quite satisfactory. 
I will hope continually. I will hope forever because I'm a prisoner of hope. You know, one thing we can never give up, hope. Mm. We can never give up hope. We have always reason to hope Mm -hmm. because we see his viewpoint. I am for you. I'm not against you. I am for you. I will pull you out. Just open your heart to me in prayer. I will give you victory. If you need cleansing, bring everything to me. I will clean you. I will be faithful to you. I will hope continually, but then I will praise you more and more. Uh, The translation doesn't quite cut it here. The true translation is, I will add to all your praise. I will add to all your praise and This is my closing comment here. Imagine when the kingdom of God will be here in a visible form and all kinds of people will give testimony. They could be King David and they could be Moses. They could be Yohanan, the great apostle, Shaliah, and all these men of God and Wurbrandt who suffered 14 and a half years in prison for his faith, a Jewish man whom I so highly appreciate, and anyone else. I have so many friends I could mention here. But you and I, we can rise up and say, I will yet add to his praise. Every believer has something to add to the praise of God and to the glory of God that no one else can add. I meditated on that verse once, and it was like a revolution to my soul. Every image of God, everyone, and whether he is a Hebrew or non-Hebrew, uh, is not the important thing from the starting point. Whoever we are, everyone who is an image of God and accepts a redemption that God gave. Everyone has a testimony no one else has. And the Father says, I want that part. Even if Moshe, if Moses himself and Isaiah and Yohanan or whoever had given the best and longest messages, you and I can raise up and say, I have one more thing to add about the glory of God. I have something to add to his praise. I am the needy one. This is how he showed grace to me. And you know what? The whole universe needs that testimony. The whole universe needs that testimony. Uh, I want to close with this. When I walk into this coffee house, I remember many years ago, we had thousands and hundreds of thousands, maybe, uh, people coming from uh, former Soviet Union, and they were new here, and we were in a bookshop, and one of these uh, ladies came, and kind of like looking if we had something to give her, and I said, yeah, we have uh, the Bible to give you, and Russian language. And I handed her the Bible. She was so hungry to know what it was. She didn't know these things. And I gave her the Bible more than 20 years ago. Today she met me in a coffee shop and said, do you remember when you gave that Bible to me? I read it. I believed it. And today I'm in a good messianic fellowship that believes in the God of Israel and the Messiah, I thought, all of us have a something. We may not even be aware, but this is what the grace of God is about. This is what the grace of God is about. In the name of Yeshua, Amen. Amen.